Hello. So glad that you're joining us and me today here as we take time to pause and join together spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and even physically as you bring your body to this moment. Though as a community, we are not together physically in this online space, know that you do not stand alone this day. We're tethered by this church community. I pray that this time that you and we have set apart to pray, to sing, to hear the words of scripture anew would be life-giving to you this day. We celebrate in particular this week, the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Our worship service is reflective of that which Dr. King dedicated his life to, justice. Pastor Brian will be teaching today out of Isaiah 42 as we find ourselves in week two of our journey through Promised Land. And later, Pastor Jeanette will be joined by two guests as they too reflect on the words of Isaiah and consider what it looks like today to practically pursue justice. If you're newer to Grace Chapel, we're really glad that you're here and we'd love to make a personal connection with you. So we invite you to text us the word hello and we'll send you a gift card for a cup of coffee or hot chocolate on us. And if you're looking maybe for a way to grow more in your faith or in community, joining a group might feel like the next right, right step for you. Groups are actually a central piece of how we live out our lives as disciples here at Grace. And it's where the real life of the church takes place as we gather together with a consistent small group of other believers to dig into God's word, share our lives with one another, and encourage and challenge one another on our discipleship walk. Our goal is that everyone who calls Grace home would be involved in one kind or another of a group. We have ongoing groups for men, women, couples, families, groups meeting online and in person, groups meeting in English, Chinese, and Korean, groups meeting on weekdays and weekends. And this season, we're also launching several new short-term groups, which are a great way to get started in group life if you've never been a part of one before. This month, we're launching online short-term groups open to people from all of our campuses on personal financing, parenting, dealing with anxiety, exploring your faith journey, and a few others, one of which Pastor Jeanette will highlight later in the service. To sign up for any of our ongoing or short-term groups, you can go to grace.org groups or reach out to your campus pastor or me at lnight at grace.org. Well, as we prepare our hearts for worship today, I invite you to pray with me. God, we remember with gratitude the witness of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. this day. We ask for the courage and determination to follow his example in battling injustice and embodying gospel love. We ask also for courage and determination to be forgiven of and freed from the bonds of hatred, ignorance, fear, racism, and injustice. Open our eyes, our hearts, and our ears during this time that we've set aside to hear your invitation to the work of justice today. Amen.
Just last week, the oldest living World War II veteran passed away. Lawrence Brooks was 112 years old when he died. He was drafted in 1940 and discharged after his year of obligatory service. But after the attack on Pearl Harbor, he re-enlisted and went on to serve in the South Pacific with the 91st Engineer Battalion, where he came under fire on more than one occasion. After the war, he settled in his home state of Louisiana, where he raised a family, worked as a forklift operator, and served his local church. It's a pretty good story, except for one thing. After serving his country, Brooks was denied the standard government GI benefits, like tuition assistance and home mortgage approval. As a result, he and his family missed out on the post-war economic boom that, that lifted millions of veterans and their families into middle-class American life. And he was denied those benefits for one reason, the color of his skin. Lawrence Brooks was a black man, one of over a million African Americans who served in World War II, many of whom were denied their benefits by local VA offices simply because of their skin color. The result is that generations of black American families have suffered economic discrimination and disadvantage ever since. That's not right, we say. That's not fair, that's not just, and it's not. But it's just one of many painful reminders that, that our nation has not yet delivered on its promise of liberty and justice for all. And we've had too many reminders of that in recent years. The violent deaths of unarmed black men and women, acts of hate toward Asian Americans, the mistreatment of immigrant children on our southern border, the generational repression of Native Americans, wage inequities for women in the workplace, the marginalization of people with different abilities, and the failure to protect the unborn. And all of that bothers us. It makes us mad. And it should because it's not right. It's not just. But if it bothers us, imagine how it bothers God, who made every one of those people in his image, that they might enjoy and contribute to the flourishing of the world he's made and given to us. It actually bothers God so much that God promises to do whatever it takes for as long as it takes to put things right in this world, to see that there really is liberty and justice for all. Now, this winter we are considering some of the promises of God, promises that are especially meaningful for the in-between times of our lives between jobs or relationships or stages of life, between a pre- and a post-pandemic world, but ultimately between the first and second coming of Christ. In between times, we said, are unfamiliar and, and uncertain and uncomfortable. And when we're in between, we often forget who we are. We lose sight of where we're going. We don't know what we're supposed to do next. So we're turning to the words of an ancient prophet named Isaiah, a prophet with a message for people who found themselves in exile, living in a strange land for 70 uncomfortable and uncertain years. 
It was an in-between time of the worst kind that affected every aspect of their lives. But through the prophet Isaiah, God made promises to those people. Promises that would sustain them in that strange land and lead them to better days to come. And those promises are just as relevant to our in-between times today. So last week, we learned that God promises strength. The strength to carry on, to keep going, to fly or run or walk in the direction of better days to come. Now, if you missed last Sunday's message, I really encourage you to, to go back and listen. It not only sets up the series, but it explores one of the most beautiful passages in all the Bible. But this week, we come to another great passage of Scripture, Isaiah 42, and to uh, uh, another promise for these in-between times, the promise of justice. So in the, in the first half of today's message, we'll explore what justice means and, and why it matters. And then I'm going to hand off to Pastor Jeanette and a couple of friends who will help us understand what the promise of justice means for our lives and for the church today. So let's turn to the opening verses of Isaiah 42. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nation. Now, this is the first of what scholars call the servant songs of Isaiah. There are four of them in this half of the book. And each one tells us a bit more about this mysterious figure. Now, God is speaking here through the prophet and introducing a servant who will act on his behalf in human history. But who is this servant? It brings to mind the, the old Western movies when a, when a new sheriff comes riding into some troubled town, promising to restore law and order. Who is this stranger? Will he really be able to put things right? Who is this servant? Well, earlier in the Bible, the servant word is used to describe national leaders, like, like Moses or Joshua or David. In chapter 41, right before this, the word is used to describe Israel, the nation itself. But here, it seems to be describing a unique individual, chosen by God, anointed with the Spirit of God, and on a mission from God. Sure, sure sounds like Jesus to us, right? But that's because we've seen the rest of the movie. But the original readers, even Isaiah himself likely, had no idea who this servant would be, or when he would appear, or how he would carry out his mission. So they just called him Messiah, the Anointed One, and they eagerly awaited his coming. And the next verses tell us what this servant will do. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. He won't come with guns blazing, this servant, but he will come with a strong and gentle presence. And with two vivid metaphors, the bruised reed and the smoldering wick, Isaiah describes the kind of people and causes that this servant will take up. People who've been bruised and bent by life, but not yet broken. Causes that have just about died out, but can be fanned into flame again. He's talking about what, what we sometimes call marginalized people. The materially poor, the vulnerable the overlooked, the under-resourced, those who've been put down or held back. And the cause he's talking about is justice. Now, it's a strong word in the Hebrew language, mishpat. He uses it three times in these few verses. It describes 
everything being done right, everything being put right, the, the way it was meant to be when, when God made men and women in his image, gave them freedom to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And, and, and this justice, this rightness, this flourishing was meant for all people, for the whole earth, Isaiah says, even the distant islands, he says. In other words, the farthest reaches of the planet. Uh, someone has said that justice means not just us. It means everyone gets the same opportunity. It means a level playing field. It means no one is advantaged or disadvantaged because of some arbitrary characteristic like the color of their skin or their abilities or their gender or their orientation or their faith, or their zip code, or their physical appearance. Justice is a value deeply embedded in the human psyche, placed there by our Creator. It shows up early in life. Have you seen, have you seen the commercial where, where one kid gets a big lollipop and his sister gets a smaller one? That's not fair, the young girl snaps. And we get it. I mean, we feel the same thing every time someone cuts ahead of us in line. We feel it every time we hear about an innocent person spending a lifetime in jail or a guilty person not being held accountable. And as we said, we, we've felt it a lot lately, this instinct for justice. And on this Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, and we're reminded that while we have made progress toward his dream of a just nation, we have not arrived yet. We're still on the way. We're, we're in between the dream and its fulfillment. And, and this passage reminds us that it's a, a dream deeply rooted, not only in the American dream, as Dr. King put it, but in God's dream his vision for all humankind to flourish. And in these words from Isaiah 42, God promises to make good on that vision, even if he has to send his own son to bring it about. And in the weeks to come, we'll learn exactly what it will cost this servant to fulfill this promise. But there's one more thing I want to show you before I hand off to Pastor Jeanette. Let's skip down to verse 6. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open the eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Now, who, who is God talking to here? The chosen servant or, or his people, Israel? Well, commentators have written pages and pages on that question, but the simple answer seems to be both. God is speaking to his servant, but also through his servant to his people, so that together, in covenant with each other, they can be a light to the Gentiles. The Gentiles is, is shorthand for the rest of the world. In other words, this, this vision is for all people everywhere. And in particular, those that have, that have been left out or shut out of, of the flourishing that, that others are experiencing. That's justice. Not just us, but everyone sharing equally in the glory and goodness of God. In the words of one commentator, God promises that the servant will undo all the horrendous and degrading effects that sin has had on the human race and restore to people their true freedom and dignity as sons and daughters of God. And here's the thing we don't want to miss. The servant invites and expects God's people to participate in that work, to join hands with him and one another to do the work of justice. 
opening eyes and doors that have been closed, freeing people from unjust systems, releasing them from stereotypes and prejudices that have caused such harm. I, I, I want us to notice, he, he's not describing the work of compassion here, as important as that work is. He doesn't talk about assisting eyes that are blind and visiting those that are in prison. He talks about opening eyes that are blind and freeing those who are, are imprisoned. The servant is looking beyond the ministry of compassion to the work of justice, to the work of putting things right. And he invites us to join him in that work now, today, in anticipation of the work he will complete someday. So that's the message I'd like to leave you with today. God's promise of justice someday compels us to work for justice today. God's promise of justice someday compels us to work for justice today. Knowing that justice is at the heart of God's vision for humankind, knowing that he has sent his son into the world to suffer and die in the pursuit of justice, knowing that God promises one day to bring that justice in all of its fullness, how can we not join him in that work now, today, as individuals and, and as the church, because we are the body of Christ, his hands, his feet, and his voice in this world. God's promise of justice someday compels us to work for justice today. Uh, let's allow Pastor Danette and a couple of her friends to help us dig a little deeper into this theme. Well, through the miracle of Zoom, I'm thrilled and honored to introduce you to some friends of mine who are joining me to discuss some of the practical implications of Isaiah 42, which Pastor Brian has just taught on. Vivian Mabuni serves on staff with crew with her husband, Darren, in Los Angeles. A wise and experienced veteran crew staff worker, Vivian has led mission teams. She's trained students and staff. She's the author of two books and is a very popular conference speaker. Ed Ollie is a native of Iowa. He played Division III football, and he was Dwayne The Rock Johnson's chaplain at the University of Miami. Currently, Ed is, the is on the teaching team and is the campus pastor of Willow Creek's North Shore campus. He and his bride, Marsha, have three children, and they live in Chicagoland. I want to give you guys a big thanks for joining us today. We're so honored and we're so grateful to have an opportunity to reason together and to learn from you. So I've invited you both to meditate on this passage from Isaiah 42. And as you've done that, is there a verse or a section of this passage that grabs your heart and mind? Something that convicts or challenges you? Well, I just want to say Thank you for having us, and it's just an honor to be here. I think the world of you, Jeanette, and also of Pastor Brian, so really it's wonderful to be a part of the Grace Chapel community. Um, when I look at Isaiah 42, and I think about how justice is repeated three times, I think the conversation of justice can be discouraging and even heavy at times. And so that's where my eyes are drawn to verse 5 and God's character again. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it. I think our, our tendency often um, as people is that we uh, put more value sometimes in animals than we do people. We humanize animals in movies and we dehumanize hu people made in the image of God. So immigrants and refugees become threats or are unclean. And we will spend our resources and our money to free a, a trapped whale in an iceberg um, and treat people uh, with disdain. And so when I think about what my heart is drawn to is realizing that God doesn't change and his character never changes his goodness, that he is the creator, that he is above all, and that he is our anchor, which gives me hope. And as we walk with him, as we 
uh, as our hearts expand, then the things that matter to him matter to us. So that's what kind of struck me from this particular passage. Well, you know, we, we, we really want to hear a little bit more of your life experiences as well as you have confronted some places of um, injustice in places where, you know, um, based on who you are and what you look like, your racial, ethnic background, your surname, or your physical appearance. I'm wondering if, if each of you would be willing to share a place of pain where you personally experience injustice. And, and how did you respond to it? How did you, you know, how did you not lose heart after that? You know, what kept you going? Well, I would love to um, jump in. I know um, that when we talk about pain, uh, we often miss the purpose of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, my world and a lot of my world has been as a bridge builder in the evangelical community. And I would love to say that that time has been uh, filled with joy and, and, and no problems. But I've had a front seat at uh, some of the most tragic elements of the evangelical community in some places that I've served. And some of that has been personal attack uh, based upon uh, my, my race. Uh, not just the reality of the gifts and the places that God has placed me, but um, personal attack. I'll never forget one uh, moment that I was in a board meeting and um, I'll spare the details uh, for time uh, but I think it was one of the most difficult moments that I had experienced as uh, a leader. It was precisely in that point and in that place that I knew that I was not only called, I knew that I was loved, I knew that I was a son, and I knew that I had to lean in and extend grace uh, where grace was not deserved. Thank you. Uh, for me, I remember... Um, coming out of the bathroom stall and washing my hands and this white older white woman walked up to me and she looked at me and said you China and I looked at her and I said uh actually I was born in Wisconsin mm -hmm. and then she looked again and she goes you mommy daddy China <laughs> and I was I was just so done I just said yes they were born there and I just walked out of the bathroom and just in those moments, it's uh, for many Asian American uh, people, it's death by a thousand cuts. There's, it's, it's this, uh, this othering, this perpetual foreigner, this exoticizing, uh, this, all of this turns into often an internalized racism, a self-loathing that I've had to really work out in my faith. You know, the passage in verse four says it uh, encourages us to not falter or lose heart. So how do you not lose heart in the light of situations like that? You know, simple things, small things, sometimes huge things and, and very painful things. How do you not lose heart? I think for me, one of the ways that uh, I don't lose heart is to stay close to people who are different mm -hmm. than me, that reflect the hope. Um, that I desire to see in the world. Uh, it's a very personal thing for me. My two nieces uh, are uh, both from China. Uh, my sister-in-law is from Colombia, um, and my in-laws are white, and my wife is adopted, and she's biracial. It's not an experiment. It, it becomes very personal for us. But then um, I have the privilege of pastoring uh, a campus that is 30% Asian. Uh, I have uh, almost 8% African-American, uh, I have Latino and international. And so it's not something that uh, for us in my family is something that is an option, uh, but we have to be in close proximity to people who are different than us to actually not lose heart and not lose hope. I think frankly, Jeanette, if I was further away uh, from the promise of justice that Sunday um, we talk about. I'm so glad that Pastor Brian, uh, your words, that God's promise of justice Sunday compels us to work for justice today. It's because um, the glory of God is at stake and not just the glory of God being at stake, but even um, our very existence as 
a church, a mm -hmm. church that is genuinely for the community. Uh, all of that is irrelevant if, in fact, uh, we aren't living this out in close proximity. I also think it's important for us to have safe spaces mm -hmm. to be validated, to have yeah. language for our, our experience. So sometimes my white brothers and sisters don't understand why um, we need different tables at times to kind of regroup and be filled up again so that we can continue to engage. Um, the the multi-ethnic churches where everyone feels uncomfortable mm -hmm. is a sign that there's equity happening mm -hmm. and that there's not one dominant culture. Mm -hmm. But there is something to be said about being with people who totally get it and I can talk, I can say something like, oh, Asian dad, and everyone knows what I'm talking about, or everyone just naturally takes their shoes up at the door, and there's no explaining necessary. But that kind of, uh, I think, settles my soul in a way that helps me to then re-engage with the diversity and the, the beauty that is the people of God. Um, you know, this whole year, this past year, these pandemic years now, um, we've seen a kind of a different kind of racial reckoning um, since the death of Mr. Floyd in Minneapolis and then the hate crimes against the Asian spa workers. Um, and I, one thing it looks to me is that folk are crossing ethnic and different kinds of traditional boundaries as they've worked together to fight injustice. And can you, can you share some examples where you've seen some of this happen? And what do you think that means for, for us as a, as a nation and for us as a church? I think out of some of the, the pain has come forth some really great organizations. And one that I'm really excited about is the Asian American Christian Collaborative. They've done some really excellent work in standing in solidarity with our black brothers and sisters. I think Asian Americans often don't realize the history that we stand on the shoulders of our black brothers and sisters, that we enjoy certain civil rights because of the leaders that have come before us. And so the more that we know history and the more that we can link arms, um, I think it's really, really powerful, especially during these times. And there's been historically places where there has been hurt that has happened between different ethnic communities. So we have um, been talking pretty high level, kind of abstract. So let's get, get down and real and practical. Can you give us some ideas or experiences um, where we can work as God's people to make things right, to help bring justice and demonstrate God's righteousness to neighbors that we have near and far? Can you give us some practical ways of um, how we might do that? I'll give you three. Uh, I want to first really challenge uh, the global excuse of busyness. Uh, we all know we're not. Uh, we're not all busy. We choose to spend time doing the things that matter to us. And so three things that you can do. One, you can stay curious. And the way that you stay curious is two ways. One, feed your mind um, by reading uh, and learning about the experiences of those that are different from you. But then I wanna take it a step further, even in the context of COVID, what does it mean to be in relational conversation with someone who is close and different than you? You might say, well, Ed, everyone around my neighborhood is this uh, nationality. Well, great, you get a star. Well, what you could do is actually take a step and be proactive where you shop, where you um, choose to get your favorite beverage, where um, you in your community, do you see, whether it's through the media or through um, your workplace, whether remotely or not, there are people who are different than you. Take the time to become to a better listener. Mm -hmm. Asking good questions leads to deeper trust. People don't really know, care at all what you do. Uh, people don't really care about your past story, honestly. What they care about is what you care about with them now. And I think that that proximity of being a better listener really matters. And then the third thing is place yourself in um, a situation where you are in the minority to learn. Not to be a teacher, but position yourself in a place that's different. So for me, um, I am a youth basketball coach in a suburban neighborhood. Um, we don't have uh, the proximity 
uh, to the African American community that we once did when we were in the city of Chicago. We're now in the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, so I am a youth basketball coach and my ministry is 12 families that are represented by knuckleheads that are with my son. And so <laughs> I am learning um, again, what is important to them in placing myself in a position of servant leadership. Uh, I know Vivian probably has several um, examples as well, but those are three things that I um, just practically am thinking of. Those are so great, Ed. I would just say for my, in dovetailing right off of what Ed has shared, for my non-Asian brothers and sisters, read widely. Um, I would say, if possible, put yourself under the leadership of a person of color. Uh, defensive people cannot empathize. So a, a, a humble heart, a teachable learner's posture will go a long, long way. Uh, I would challenge those of you that if you scroll through your Instagram account and everybody on your feed looks like you, then intentionally seek to diversify and to pray. If the Lord, if you don't have anyone else, there are ways to take in information and learn history. I think learning history helps give context to all that is going on. So those are some of the things for, um, you know, for my non-Asian uh, brothers and sisters, just listen more. And then for my Asian American brothers and sisters, I would say push against the cultural, uh, I don't, the cultural uh, ways that we've been formed to not rock the boat and actually learn to speak up. And I would say it's on us to be able to speak up when our Asian uh, generations, older generations say derogatory things or uh, conclude things that are inaccurate about our black and brown brothers and sisters to correct it and to speak up and to learn to do that. Um, what we say and what we do matters. And so, uh, and again, back to what Ed said, you know, proximity matters. And everything changes when we have real friends who are of different hues. Uh, we watch the news differently. We respond differently to the hashtags. It's not um, just someone, something out there. It's personal because of our relationships. And so, again, there's nothing that replaces the, the ability for us to really be involved in each other's lives. Wow. You guys are so totally awesome and so totally wise. And uh, it just makes me want to do a banquet together where we can just sit and talk and listen and laugh and share more stories. Uh, we want to thank you on behalf of the church. We want to thank you for joining us today, busy folk from different parts of our country. And, you know, as you start this new year, we're asking, we'd ask the Lord to really bless you and your families and the ministry and the work that you're doing, your kingdom people who are doing some significant kingdom things. And may the Lord grow you and prosper you, watch over you, and uh, protect you from harm as you continue to follow hard after him. Thanks, friends, for joining us. We're really grateful. Thank you. Wow. What a rich time of learning on this Martin Luther King Jr. Sunday. Pastor Brian helps us understand that God is a God of justice and righteousness. And in fact, God promises to bring justice to all people. And and the amazing thing is he's chosen us to get this done. He's inviting us to join in this work. So let me suggest three possible action steps that you can take today or tomorrow during our Martin Luther King three-day weekend. First, reread and meditate on today's passage, Isaiah 42, verses one through nine. Invite God's spirit to teach you and guide you as you chew on it, just like a cow chews on its cud. There are so many rich truths to be discovered here. And second, sign up for the class Pastor Richard and I will be leading based on the book, When Helping Hurts. This book reminds us that good intentions are not enough if we are to be effective in helping bring God's kingdom to earth. You can find the link on our website or you can email me or Pastor Richard to join us in this learning community. We start this Tuesday evening by Zoom. And thirdly, did you know that each campus has a community engagement team 
which expresses tangibly our commitment to our neighbors and our neighborhood. Just reach out to your campus pastor and you can learn a lot more. There are some amazing things that are already happening near you. You can join us and bless others and be blessed in the process. Well, as we conclude our worship today, would you take a few moments to prayerfully reflect on this blessing, which was written by our friend, Siska Nunn. Join me in prayer. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half truths and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression and the exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, and starvation, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I'm anointed to bring hope. The promise fulfilled in a moment, we're still watching it unfold. There's good news for the captive, a proclamation for every soul. This liberty is for the broken, an invitation to be made whole. Blessing for the free man singing his delight.
During COVID, we've been especially reminded of the need for the work and presence of the church outside of our buildings. We've expanded and deepened in these days our partnerships with local, regional, and even global organizations and ministries who are working for good and justice for all. Every one of our campuses has local partners that we're working with, be it food banks or local schools, community centers, or neighborhood ministries like the Boston Project. You can learn more about this work at grace.org slash community engagement. You can also reach out directly to your campus pastor or to me if you'd like to get involved in any of that work. My email is lnight at grace.org. We'd love for you to help us embody the gospel love to our neighbors. So may we be people who work not just for compassion, but for justice. May our eyes be open to our blind spots and our hearts be freed from the imprisonment of our tendencies toward hatred, ignorance, fear, racism, and injustice. May we allow God to do a work not just through us, but in us. Let justice roll down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Amen.